Hey everybody, my name is Rick and I've been on the editorial panel for the CIS Critical Security Controls for many years and part of version 8. This is the 10th in my series where we talk about the deep dive in each of the different controls. I have links to my videos for 129 down in the description as long as a link to the CISsecurity.org site where you can download your own copy of the CIS Critical Security Controls to follow along at home. So today we're talking about number 10, Malware Defenses. Malware defenses moved down two shots from the list in version 7, where it was, of course, number 8. Uh, this is another kind of one-to-one -one type of um, update from version 7 to version 8. You'll see that we pretty much just took most of the subcontrols from version 7, but there are a few that were obviously like in the wrong control. I, I, I even had to double check the version 7 document to make sure it wasn't a misprint, but you'll see what I talk when I talk about that later. Now this control is specifically applies to malware defenses on assets, not about like network or, or perimeter or entry points or things like that. So let's look at the controls. There are seven safeguards in control 10, and we'll bring up a version 8 over here and version 7 over there. Remember we renamed the subcontrols to safeguards and we reordered the safeguards to align with the implementation implementation groups. Um, 10.1 to deploy and maintain anti-malware software is really a simplification of, of 8.1. This is kind of an interesting one because it, technically in 8.1 we had two asks, which we, we don't like, you know, deploy and we kind of imply deploying it and essentially, and then we say essentially management. You know, we broke these up since uh, we wanted an implementation group one organization to at least deploy the anti-malware, may not necessarily need to be centrally managed. Now, also originally in, in version 7, we never really technically require an implementation group one to um, deploy anti-malware. We just kind of said, you know, update signatures and scam removable media and it kind of implying that we had it. So this was like a clarification. I actually went back and checked version six and we had, <clears throat> and that one in the, ver in, in the 8.1, because it was also um, number eight back then too. We had a lot of asks, <laughs> employ antivirus, a firewall, host base IPS, centralized log management. We, you know, certainly streamlined a lot since then. So very happy with that update. Okay. 10.2. It was just pretty much a rephrasing of 8.2, configure automatic anti-malware signature updates. 10.3, uh, disable auto run and auto play for removable media is really a rewording of 8.5, configure devices not to auto run content. Um, you know, so again, the first three are for implementation group one. Every small business should be able to do these. These are native to antivirus packages. 10.4, configure automatic anti-malware scanning of removable media is really rewording of 8.4, where we just added automatic. In 10.5, it's a simplification of 8.3, enable anti-exploitation features. Also in 8.3, we had two ask, which we weeded out in, in version 8. We like enable anti-exploitation features and deploy anti-exploit technologies. In 10.6, essentially managed anti-malware software is pulled from 8.1, where we made it its own safeguard. In 10.7, use behavior-based anti-malware is essentially, you know, every modern, you know, endpoint detection and response EDR tool. You know, back in the day, anti-malware was signature-based. Uh, 15 years ago, they talked about heuristics where they say, ooh, we're looking at how things work, but it never really worked that well. Um, and now we have more advanced tools that, that look in, not just matching for hatches of malicious files, but in, in, the, in the file or in code, but, but we're looking at behaviors that are anomalous. So, you know, this is just enforcing it. Any implementation group two and three organization should have a good um, EDR tool as part of their, their assets. So what did we bring over? What did we not bring over from, ver from version seven? So remember I said at the beginning, it was like, why are these even here? You know, so we look at 8.6 centralized anti-malware logging. We moved that to uh, version eight control eight about audit log management. And that kind of seemed to make sense there. 8.7 enable DNS query logging was moved to version eight, 8.6. And 8.8 .8, enable command line audit logging was also moved to it was moved to 8.8 .8 in version 8. Um, we consolidated all the logging safeguards in one control, though I'm not quite sure why we had DNS query and command line logging in the anti-malware technology. I mean, I, I understand technically why they relate to malware in that, you know, malware will run scripts, an attempt to connect to malicious sites on command, malicious sites and command and control, and these were the ways to be able to technique to identify these 
techniques, you know, but we want to be anti malware, not spot when malware exists. But so, but these obviously team more um, appropriate in control number eight when we talk about audit log management. So now that I noted the changes, let's do a deep dive. We'll pull these things down and pull up the details for um, 10. Control 10. I guess, starting with 10.1. Um, this is another one of these controls that we didn't include the developing of a process, uh, since this control is more about applying controls and detection. So 10.1 is basic request to install anti-malware. You know, this is implementation group one organization. 10.2, another fundamental, uh, keep the signatures up to date. This is simple, every implementation group level, whether centralized or not, you know, there's sometimes, you know, misconfigurations can, you know, cause a software not to update. So make sure you keep that in check. 10.3 is native to all anti-malware or EDR tools. As I've said before, it's simple to implement. The importance of this is to protect against people plugging in malicious USB devices, intentionally or unintentionally. 10.4 goes along with 10.3, where even if the USB may not be malicious itself, you know, check the files on it to make sure they're safe before you open them. 10.5 refers to preventing the execution of malware on the asset, such as like data execution, prevention, DEP tools, or host base IPSs. Um, but while this capability seems kind of advanced, it's really native to both operating systems of Microsoft and Apple and, and all the EDR tools. When we talked about anti-exploitation features, it's it's not really a common term feature used. I mean, it became popular in the early 2010s for protection against down drive by downloads, you know, which are exploits directly from the web that were not coming from a file that AV would be scanning. Um, now it's all, you know, like I said, it's embedded in the operating system. It's not that big of a deal. NSA actually produced a document about anti-exploitation features back in 2015. It's only two pages. I'll have a link for it in the description below. 10.6, like we said, this is split out of 10.1, and it should be standard for all but the smallest organizations. Centralized management brings central logging and alerting, isolation of capabilities, investigation capabilities, and triage capabilities. Probably should switch those. But <laughs> um, and 10.7 is basically saying to use an EDR tool. <laughs> EDR tools are more advanced, are centrally managed, and as well as not being purely signature-based, they bring all the features I just said before when I talked about 10.6. So now let's look at the upfront material or narrative as we refer to it. So let me get this down and bring up the malware defenses, you know, main page here. We condense the overview in, eight, in version eight to simply just say prevent or control the installation, spread and execution of malicious applications, code or scripts on enterprise assets. And I went back and looked at version seven. We had a long rambling overview. Um, you know, we talked about control the installation, spread, and execution of malicious code and multiple points of the enterprise. We're optimizing the use of automation, enable rapid updating of defense and data gathering and corrective action. Whew, that was a lot. But I don't judge because I probably wrote it. It was actually in ver still in version six, so it's very likely that I wrote that. Um, anyway, and why this control is critical, we talk about the prevalence of malware, describe its intended purpose and what it does, with, such as capturing credentials or encrypting or destroying data. We highlight how it has evolved to actually use machine learning techniques. We talk about how it enters the organization and how modern malware is smarter to avoid and disable defenses. We enforce the use of automation, especially in updates, and how anti-malware alerts need to be tied to the vulnerability management and incident response process. Um, we talk about procedures and tools. Let's go. Wait, I don't have to change pages. It's, it's only one page. Great. Okay. So we talk about the use of traditional endpoint malware protection tools and especially more advanced EDR tools. We discuss how blocking is only one part of the control, but the collection of logs, alerting, and, in, and incident identification are necessary to enforce good response capabilities. We talk about threat actors, you know, using the living off the land approach to hide themselves in the environment by using tools that are common or trusted within the environment after they've already gained a foothold. And finally, we touch on logging from control eight um, to support alerts identifying incidents and, and supporting investigations. So this wraps up uh, Control 10. Hopefully this was helpful to go over the changes between 7 and 8. If you haven't already, go ahead and download the controls yourself from cisecurity.org. Secur uh, and in, the link is in the description. If you have any questions or comments, sign up for the Controls Workbench, which is also a link in the description where you can post your own questions or comments and contribute to the next version. And as always, feel free to leave me a comment below and don't forget to like and subscribe. Have a great day. Buddy, as I've said many times, I don't have any pets to share, but list lots of interesting art and craft items. This is a kind of a mechanical frame. 
It doesn't actually move. I got it in Key West in a fine art area. I uh, had it for probably 13 years. I actually forgot what who the artist is. Uh, if someone knows, feel free to put it in the description. Anyway, enjoy.